Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much to our organizers for putting on this great conference. I'm Henry Shevlin, and I'm maybe coming at some of these issues from a slightly different background. I'm a philosopher, and I'm mainly interested in understanding what we mean by concepts like intelligence, consciousness, agency, and how AI is going to encourage us to reflect on these concepts over the coming years. And mainly today, I want to talk about some limitations of existing artificial intelligence and draw a comparison with the capacities of natural systems, of animals. Because I think there are some important ways that I'm going to discuss today in which our best cutting edge artificial systems still fall short of the kind of things that animals can do. So this is obviously a great time for AI. AI is thriving. Uh, we have lots of events like this, lots of money uh, being poured into AI research. Um, but we also have some important challenges. Those of you who are familiar with Moore's law, for example, uh, tracking the speed at which processing speed increases, for example, will know that it's been slowing, at least according to some metrics. Computers aren't getting faster at quite the same rate or at quite the same way as they have in previous years. It's also important to manage expectations. AI research has had many successes over the last 60 years, but it's also had some big setbacks, leading to AI winters, as they're sometimes called, periods when public excitement about AI and funding for AI drops, maybe because expectations have been too high or the field has been overhyped. And this is something that we're seeing in the media now, with people worrying about the prospects of another AI winter. Certainly, there's a lot of hype around AI at the moment. Could it be that we're going to be facing another period of adjustment, of pessimism? But I think there are still grounds for optimism. Business and academia are investing in AI at a, an unprecedented scale. So many young people, so many young, talented researchers, like I'm sure many of the people in this audience, are going into AI because that's where the exciting ideas are, and that's also where the money is a lot of the time. This can create a forcing economy. The more people get into AI, the faster the field grows, and the faster the field grows, the more people want to go into the field. Our data sets, which are obviously a core component of contemporary AI research, particularly deep learning, are growing at a crazy scale as people use their phones to pay for things, as we get biometric data from people. So total global data sets were estimated at around 4.4 trillion gigabytes in just 2013, and now we're up to at least 18 trillion gigabytes in data sets. And importantly, there's awareness among leading AI researchers of the limitations of existing paradigms. And there's an openness in many communities to learning from neuroscience, to learning from cognitive science, to learning from comparative psychology. But I think amid all these signs of optimism, it is very important to recognize that current AI systems still lack what I'm going to call general intelligence. So maybe a good idea, a good way to get a handle on general intelligence is to use this beautiful image by British philosopher Isaiah Berlin of the fox and the hedgehog. So the idea here is that the fox knows lots of things. The fox has lots of different strategies for surviving. It can hunt, it can forage, it can eat everything from grubs and worms to rabbits. It has lots of different ways of surviving. But the hedgehog, by contrast, has one really cool trick. It can roll into a ball to protect itself. The hedgehog has a specialized survival strategy, whereas the fox has a more general set of strategies it can use. And most AI right now is still at the hedgehog stage. We're building systems that can do one thing very, very well. We haven't yet built foxes, artificial intelligence with this kind of general suite of capacities. And to think about the applications of these different kinds of AI systems, think about the different challenges that are imposed by building a computer that's going to be a chess grandmaster, that's got, to be, got one task to be the best in the world at playing chess, versus a system like a home cleaner, a home cleaning robot that needs to navigate the complex environments of your average household, avoid toddlers, avoid pets, clear out your coffee machine, take out your trash. That requires general intelligence, because it requires the system to navigate these complex, rapidly changing environments. So a useful way to think about general intelligence is to break it down into three categories. The first one is robustness the ability to do tasks without getting stuck, without getting caught, without getting uh, lost. The second is flexibility, the ability to take what you know about one thing, about one task, and apply it to another. And the last one is autonomy, the ability to do everything you need to do without constant adjustment, constant 
of repair, constant oversight by a third party. And one point I'd like to make is that animals excel brilliantly in all these benchmarks in sharp, in sharp contrast to existing artificial systems. And this, to me, suggests that in looking forward not just 10 years, but 20 years or 30 years, one of the main sources for development at AI is going to be learning from nature, copying nature's best tricks. So let's talk about these three metrics in a little more detail. So I assume this is very much common sense, but animals can accomplish the things they need to do. Feeding, mating, hunting, escaping predators. They can do that in a wide variety of environments and conditions. Just to give a couple of nice examples, honeybees thrive in every continent except Antarctica. And despite very similar genetic, uh, very similar genes across these different honeybees in different parts of the world, they've all managed to adapt to their local environments, changing their behavior to take into account different climates, different weather patterns, different kinds of flora and fauna. Another example of robustness in animals is the amazing capacities of birds year after year to do these incredibly long migrations. In the case of the great snipe, 5,500 kilometers, making stop-offs along the way to feed, regain energy in ways that are sensitive to, again, local climates, local food sources. In short, even the behavior of these animals, even this seemingly complex behavior, is very reliable. By contrast, most AI systems are incredibly brittle. AIs get stuck. They lose control. If you Google, if you look on YouTube for robots falling over, you'll find thousands of pretty funny videos. Whereas if you look at, for videos of things like cats falling over, OK, you'll find a few. But it's much rarer to see animals get stuck, get caught in loops to glitch out. Animals just don't have this problem. And yet, anyone who's owned a ro robot vacuum cleaner or dealt with robots will know that these are perennial problems. So here's just a fun example. This is a robot that's trying to open a valve, and it's doing its best. It thinks it's got the valve. It's reaching out. Oh, and it's missed the valve. But will it be able to recover? What's it going to do now? Oh, dear. <laughs> so that's an example of the kind of failure of robustness, the brittleness of the behavior we see in artificial systems. In general, as soon as you take artificial systems outside of the specific training environments where they've learned to do their tasks, maybe very, very efficiently within those environments, as soon as they leave those environments, their behavior drops off dramatically. They're vulnerable to a cascade of small errors building up into cat catastrophic mistakes. There are some examples of this that are perhaps familiar to those of you who have a background in computer science or machine learning. One of the most dramatic is these adversarial examples. So this is another catastrophic failure made by computer vision systems. In short, the system has been trained to recognize this image quite correctly as a dog. But then you apply a filter, and the image doesn't look any different to you or me, but the system will now classify this, this dog as an ostrich, the kind of catastrophic mistake that humans just don't make, or at least in this particular way. And this can be applied to pretty much any image for any computer vision system, you can generate these kinds of adversarial examples. One other nice example here is uh, some of you know Watson, probably, the super smart system that beat Ken Jennings at the American game show Jeopardy and was brilliant at answering questions. Yet it still made some mistakes that, by human standards, just look really dumb. So here's an example. Ken, you select again. Let's go to alternate meetings for 1,000, Alex. A thief or the bent part of an arm. Ken. What's a crook? Correct. Let's go to name the decade for a thousand. The first modern crossword puzzle is published, and Oreo cookies are introduced. Ken. What are the 20s? No. Watson. What is 1920s? No. Ken said that. So although the system was very smart, it made a stupid mistake. Ken Jennings had already guessed, what are the 1920s? And Watson then guessed, what is the 1920s, and failed to recognize that that answer had already been taken. Again, this is a stupid mistake, despite the very high level of intelligence, of specialized intelligence of the system, and illustrates these failures of robustness. So a key goal when we're thinking about what future AI is going to look like is eliminating these simple failure modes and making systems more reliable, more resilient, so they don't make these kind of errors. And this is going to require us, I think, to have a better understanding of how animals accomplish the amazing things they do. 
It's worth thinking about, particularly for future planning, what a more robust AI would look like. Well, some simple things. Imagine a system that doesn't run out of power. It can take care of its power needs. It doesn't fall over going upstairs. It doesn't glitch out. Or if it does glitch out, it can fix its own glitches. But of course, this creates worries about control as well. If a system doesn't have this kind of robustness, it's going to be harder to deactivate the system, perhaps. It's going to be able to self-correct in ways that may make it harder to control, which could be a special worry if we're thinking about malware or computer viruses. OK, on to the second dimension of general intelligence I mentioned earlier, flexibility. So again, this is an area where animals and obviously humans excel. Um, think about all the different jobs that dogs have been trained to do over the years. And everything from police dogs to guide dogs for the blind to bomb sniffing dogs to drug to drug dogs. But it's not just sophisticated animals like dogs that can do this. If you look at the learning capacities of creatures like bumblebees, you'll find they can learn to do inc incredibly impressive things. Uh, tool use has recently been demonstrated where bumblebees will learn to pull strings to get access to nectar. And they'll even learn from each other in a series of impressive experiments. They can copy each other's behavior and learn from each other to do these cool new tricks. Um, rats are capable of very intricate forward planning, stashing food in different places for different times to reflect their needs. And perhaps some of the most striking examples come from the use of tools in birds, particularly New Caledonian crows. So here's a quick example of birds performing something called the Aesop's Fable task, which essentially involves learning to drop rocks in a tube of water to raise the water level and bring a treat in view. So here's a quick demonstration of this. So that's a great video. I encourage you all to watch it online, because it shows the full range of different tasks these birds are capable of. But the key thing to take away is that even as the experiments were rapidly changing the conditions of the experiment, changing the colors of objects, whether those objects were functional, the birds were rapidly keeping track, not just learning through brute reinforcement, but making rapid changes. So most AIs fall dramatically short of this kind of performance. There are severe problems with transfer learning, taking information from one task and applying it to another and also a problem of catastrophic forgetting. An AI trained on one task, if you apply it to a second task, OK, it might eventually learn to do the second task, but by then it's forgotten how to do the first task. So one example of this comes from the Frostbite Challenge. This is part of DeepMind's Atari Games project. So this is a very simple video game that AIs can learn to do brilliantly at. The tr tricky thing is, as soon as you change the rules of the game even slightly, the performance of the AI system completely drops away. Humans, by contrast, if you change the rules, if you tell them, oh, now this object is worth more points, or this object damages your health, we can adopt our, adapt our behavior on the fly very rapidly to take into account these changing circumstances, something that AIs still can't do. Another example is the fact that AIs struggle to learn from single examples. They need many, many, typically, they need many, many instances, many, many examples in order to learn a general rule. So just a quick example of how good we are at this. So this will only work for those of you who can't read Chinese characters. But if I, you see this character, and then I cover it, and then I ask you, which of these three characters is based on that original character? Anyone want to take a guess? The first, second, or third? The second. This is a pretty easy task for humans, yet it's the kind of thing that AIs really struggle with. We can generate a general template from that one case and apply it. That's an example of one-shot learning that we can do, and AIs can't. So fast and flexible learning is a major target of current AI research with intense focus on things like transfer learning and overcoming catastrophic forgetting. But what would a more flexible artificial system look like? Just to give a quick picture, imagine a single system that can do your taxes. It can order you pizza, respond to your emails, diagnose your medical condition, and run a bath just how you like it. This is the kind of system that uh, is currently way beyond our existing capacities. Siri doesn't even come close, but might be the kind of thing that we could 
expect if we had more flexible AI. This, of course, raises worries about automation and the loss of human jobs. But I think it also raises worries about how we think about AI. When a system can do all these different things, it starts to look less like a specialized tool and more like an agent like us. OK, the last category I'm going to very quickly talk about is autonomy. So I'm thinking of autonomy in terms of the ability to manage your goals without external support. In order to be autonomous, you need to keep track of your priorities, model your environment, exploit resources, and maybe, in certain cases, self-replicate. And of course, all animals can manage this. If they couldn't, they wouldn't be alive today. Evolution has selected for creatures that are autonomous in this way. By contrast, we're decades away from robotic systems or artificial systems with these kind of capabilities, able to monitor their own power levels, repair damage, self-replicate. And even if we're thinking about more narrow forms of autonomy, functional autonomy in the case of driverless cars, for example, there are still major obstacles. There's been a realization in the autonomous vehicle community that the optimism of two or three years ago was misplaced, and we have bigger challenges to overcome than we thought. Autopilots of the kind that are used in Teslas, in Ubers and so on, in Ubers experimental vehicles, they only work in predictable conditions. And the natural environments of, uh, and the human environments of cities are anything but predictable. Still, I think auto truly autonomous systems would be a game changer and would radically change the shape of AI. Everything from autonomous vehicles that were better than humans in every metric to drones or space probes that are capable of repairing their own damage and looking after themselves. Of course, this is also a threat. Autonomous systems can operate by definition without human inputs, raising worries about losses of control. And if you think, want to think about existing autonomous artificial systems and scare yourself a little, think about computer viruses, which already exhibit a kind of autonomy. Imagine computer viruses on a larger scale, where we're not just dealing with a few, few hundred lines of code, but complex systems capable of operating without human oversight. OK, so to wrap up, um, Whilst AI has surpassed humans at many specialized tasks, from maths to logic to games like Go and Jeopardy, there are still some dramatic areas where they fall short, not just of human performance, but of animal performance, in these metrics of robustness, flexibility, and autonomy. And while we can go a long way with the systems we already have, and we haven't exploited the tools we've already got, I think the next great leap in AI, thinking 10, 20 years in the future, is going to require us to meet these challenges. Luckily, we know that systems can overcome these challenges, even simple systems, because nature has provided us with examples of systems that can do this. And it's just a matter of learning from nature's tricks. So thanks for your attention. And for more on this topic, see this recent paper by me in Ian Bear Reports. Thank you all.